In week 11, we will start to look at molecular vibrations and spectroscopy. To give you a head start, this pre-lecture video and quiz will provide some revision of the electromagnetic spectrum as well as practice with converting common spectroscopic units. As you should all remember from first year, light is an oscillating electromagnetic field that consists of an oscillating electric field drawn here in black and an oscillating magnetic field drawn here in red. These two fields are oriented perpendicular to one another and perpendicular to the direction of radiant energy propagation, which is shown by the gray arrow. Both fields also have the same wavelength, which corresponds to the distance between two peaks, as illustrated. The visible light that you and I can see is just one small part of the electromagnetic spectrum, as illustrated here. The entire spectrum spans more than 15 orders of magnitude in wavelength, frequency, and energy, which is a truly astronomical range. At the low energy end of the spectrum, radio waves have the longest wavelengths and the lowest frequency. While at the high energy end of the spectrum, gamma rays have the shortest wavelengths and the highest frequency. The parts that lie in between are generally divided into regions that we re refer to as the microwave, infrared, visible UV, and X-ray parts of the spectrum. Infrared radiation is slightly lower in energy than visible light and is what you feel as heat when you stand outside in the sun, while UV radiation is slightly higher in energy than visible light but will cause cell damage and eventually skin cancer if you spend too much time outside without protection from the sun. Infrared and UV radiation are thus both oscillating electromagnetic fields, but the different energies make all the difference between pleasant warmth and dangerous cell damage. The fact that each of these different parts of the spectrum has a different energy range is something that we can take advantage of to study a wide range of atomic and molecular properties using spectroscopy. At the low end of the energy scale, we can use radio waves to induce transitions between different magnetic nuclear spin states which is the basis for NMR spectroscopy and for the NM MRI machines used in hospitals. So if you've ever had an MRI, you have effectively been inside a low-resolution NMR spectrometer. Going up in energy, we can use microwaves to induce transitions between different rotational energy levels of molecules, and infrared radiation to excite molecules from one vibrational state to another. Valence electrons can be excited from one molecular orbital to another using visible and UV light, while core electrons are more tightly bound and so require higher energy X-rays in order to excite them. This correspondence between different parts of the spectrum and different types of spectroscopy is summarized in the following table, where the spectral range is listed on the left and the corresponding spectroscopy is listed on the right. In this course, we're going to mainly focus on vibrational ele electronic spectroscopy, but you should be aware that all these different types of spectroscopy are regularly used by chemists to study the structural, magnetic, and electronic properties of atoms and molecules. In common spectroscopic units, the wavelength, lambda, is often given in nanometers. The frequency is usually reported in inverse seconds or hertz, and the energy is typically given in kilojoules per mole. Another common spectroscopic unit that you need to be familiar with is the wave number, uh, which measures the number of wavelengths per unit distance and is typically reported in inverse centimeters and has this symbol which looks like the Greek letter nu with a squiggle on top. These common spectroscopic symbols and units are summarized here along with their corresponding SI units. When we're thinking about spectroscopy and transitions between different energy levels and molecules, we'll often have to convert between these different quantities, which we can do using the equations shown here on the left. Uh, where C here is the speed of light in vacuum, and H is Planck's constant. The equations themselves are straightforward to use, but you have to make sure to you keep track of the units. For example, the wave number is just the inverse of the wavelength, but if you want the wave number in inverse centimeters, you can't just take the wavelength in nanometers and invert it. Instead, you first need to convert the wavelength from nanometers to centimeters. So for example, 
light that has a wavelength of 500 nanometers corresponds to light with a wavelength of 5 by 10 to the minus 5 centimeters. Taking the inverse of this then tells us that light with a wavelength of 500 nanometers is the same as light with a wave number of 20,000 per centimeters. Or in other words, that 20,000 wavelengths of this light will fit into one centimeter. If, on the other hand, you want to convert from wavelength to frequency, then you would need to express the wavelength in meters before substituting it into the formula here. For example, 500 nanometer light has a wavelength of 5 by 10 to the minus 7 meters, so the frequency is given by the speed of light in meters per second divided by the wavelength in meters which gives us an answer of 6 by 10 to the 14 per second, or 6 by 10 to the 14 hertz. One thing you should notice is that I always include the units in my calculations. This is a good way of checking that your answer has the correct units and that you haven't forgotten a conversion somewhere. To finish up, I'll show you how to calculate the energy in kilojoules per mole of light that has a wavelength of 500 nanometers. We know that energy equals Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency, so we can substitute in our equation for the frequency to get an expression for the energy in terms of the wavelength, the speed of light, and Planck's constant. Substituting values into this formula then tells us that 500 nanometers light has an energy of 3.98 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. To express this in kilojoules per mole, we now need to divide by 1,000 to convert from joules to kilojoules and multiply by Avogadro's number to calculate the energy per mole, which gives us an answer of 239 kilojoules per mole. Of course, to go in the other direction, you'd have to rearrange the formulas first. So for example, E equals hc on lambda would become lambda equals hc on E.